Ready to start your ESG journey? Get going today with Social Suite, and you could start reporting publicly in 30 days. With investor pressure mounting and regulations just around the corner, there's never been a better time to start your ESG reporting. Social Suite takes the complexity out of environmental, social, and governance reporting. Social Suite helps organizations to measure, monitor, and report on their progress with fast, simple, and affordable software. Create value through ESG in order to raise capital, improve brand and reputation, as well as mitigate risk. Social Suite has helped almost 100 micro to small cap companies report on ESG, with some starting their baseline report in under 60 minutes and reporting publicly within 30 days. ESG is a lot easier than you think, and you're probably already doing it. So take your sustainability reporting to the next level with measurable progress. Start your ESG journey today with Social Suite, an ESG software company for micro to small caps. Visit socialsuitehq.com. That's social, S-U-I-T-E-H-Q.com to learn more. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Mark Walker, chairman and CEO of Direct Digital Holdings. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is DRCT on NASDAQ. Direct Digital Holdings, owner of operating companies, Colossus SSP, Huddled Masses, and Orange 142, brings state-of-the-art sell and buy side advertising platforms together under one umbrella company. Direct Digital Holdings sell side platform, Colossus SSP, offers advertisers of all sizes extensive reach within general market and multicultural media properties. The company's subsidiaries, Huddled Masses and Orange 142, deliver services for middle market advertisers by providing data-optimized programmatic solutions at scale for businesses in sectors that range from energy to healthcare to travel to financial services. Direct Digital Holdings sell and buy side solutions manage 90,000 clients monthly, generating over 100 billion impressions per month across display, CTV, in-app, and other media channels. Direct Digital Holdings is the ninth Black-owned company to go public in the U.S. and was named a top minority-owned business by the Houston Business Journal. Similar to last week's episode, I was also made aware of Direct Digital Holdings by Scott Weiss from Semco Capital. Thank you, Scott. And I invited Mark on today because I wanted to get a better understanding of the media buying and selling business, plus defining middle market of advertisers, the company's target customer, looking at the competitive landscape for media buying and selling, and understanding how direct digital holdings serves both sides in the media placement transaction. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Mark Walker, chairman and CEO of Direct Digital Holdings. Mark Thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Yeah, doing very good. Thanks for having us. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on here. So uh, th- the reason that I wanted to invite you on is that a number of investors that I know that I, that I highly respect, uh, you know, they've been following the story. They recommended maybe we we have a conversation. So, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to answer a few of my questions. And and to start off, how I'd like to on, on each one of these interviews, can you give us that one line that you would say best describes direct digital holdings? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we what we do is we help companies buy and sell media, and we leverage technology to do it to drive ROI for those companies. We're focused on primarily two marketplaces, the middle market, which we describe as five to $500 million in revenue for the buy side of our business of buying media. And then we also focused in on the multicultural publishing space which we leverage for our sell side business. And that helps us continue to fuel our growth that we've been able to experience over the last uh, year. All right. A lot of different rabbit holes we can go down there and I'm, I'm excited too. So, you know, let, let's take a step back, you know, looking at the history of direct digital holdings, you know, what, when was the company founded and what was the original thesis for its founding? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the original thesis for its founding was really taking a look at the value chain. Um, myself and previous experience that I had, I worked at a dot com back in the very late 90s, um, but really cut my teeth at a Fortune 300 company where I worked at uh, Reliant Energy or NRG Energy, where I managed their digital sales and their digital acquisition group. So really understood the top down view of the uh, digital marketing ecosystem. But then after that, I got the entrepreneurial itch and then uh, with my business partner to start started to work at Ebony Media where I was the COO and helping them through a digital transformation. And so while at Ebony Media saw how these small to mid-sized publishers that had this very rich audience that um, dealt with all of these authentic publishing brands were being left out of the programmatic egos ecosystem. Out, and I was talking to many of the peers over at Ebony, but then also saw how the whole media buying marketplace was starting to move more and more to programmatic. So had a top-down view from the corporate side, had a bottoms-up view of the end of the value chain at um, Ebony Media. And so that was really the idea and the genesis behind Direct Digital for us to be able to form a buy-side business that worked with small to mid-sized businesses, purchasing media for them at five to $500 million of revenue, and also working with multicultural publishers on their sell-side business, helping them sell media into the value chain and understanding that the most um, advantageous position to be in with this value chain is to be the first dollar in and the last dollar out and making margin on both sides of those businesses. Nice. How would you say that original thesis has changed? I mean, you kind of touched on a little bit where now everything is uh, more pro programmatic, I would argue, right? Like that's probably been the biggest change. But what else in terms of running the business would you say has changed over the years? Yeah, absolutely. What what we have seen had, that has changed and what really accelerated um, our growth and I think the industry's growth was uh, the pandemic, if you will. A lot of businesses, I would say, were caught flat footed. Um, in making this transition from traditional media into um, programmatic or digital media. And, and that actually helped fuel and accelerate and actually gave us a significant amount of tailwinds where these local and regional advertisers started to realize, wow, if I'm going to stay in business, I have to adopt um, digital marketing as a core tenant inside of our organizations, nothing that I can just put continue to push off. So we have been able to benefit from that change. We have been able to benefit from that demand. And even back in 2018, before all of this started, um, we put those processes and tools in place in order to help us um, actually execute effectively. And just when the pandemic hit and subsequently afterwards, it's actually continued to become a tailwind for us and has benefited us in the near future. That's interesting that you say, you know, post pandemic, because when I, you know, I went through the company's investor presentation, you look at quarter over quarter growth, you're like, oh, the 2020 and then, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of <laughs> hockey stick from there. Right. Um, so. So, OK. So for those that also may not be familiar with the direct digital uh, story as as much, you know, let's dive a little deeper into the actual products and how everything works together. So can you explain to us Colossus SSP and how that yep. works? Yeah, so the way that we structured the business when we um, first um, purchased um, and created Direct Digital Holdings, we had two platforms. We had the initial platform, which was Huddle Masses, and then the second platform that we had was Colossus SSP. Huddle Masses was our buy side platform, if you will, that worked directly with client, um, direct clients, um, small to mid sized businesses, and helped them to actually purchase media. Then on the second side of our business was Colossus SSP, which at the time when we initially bought it, um, it was doing about $13,000 worth of revenue. Um, and that, that business was working directly with publishers and helping them sell media into the overall uh, marketplace. So we had a buy side platform and a sell side platform. Then in 2020, and we were doing roughly at that time about $6 million worth of revenue. The company was unprofitable. So we ended up putting some operations in, cleaning up, brought in some new clients, and that really helped us grow from six million to seven million in the first year, and really turned a profit. From there, we actually saw an opportunity to buy another buy side platform called Orange One Forty Two, which actually opened us up into um, different industry space, specifically in the travel and tourism space, or what we call DMOs, which are public private partnerships that try to drive um, local and regional um, tourism into their region. 
Um, and so we purchased that company because we thought it really rounded out our buy side platform in conjunction with Huddle Masses, where at that time we were doing roughly about $30 million worth of revenue, but we continued to make investments into our sell side platform, which we felt really would be able to drive a significant amount of growth. These two businesses complement each other because our buy side platform really provides profitable and predictable revenue with a little bit slower growth, if you will, in comparison to the sell side platform of about 10 to 20 percent year over year, where our buy side, our sell side platform actually has accelerated growth and has been able to grow at 200 to 300 percent year over year. And that is actually what we started to see happen first year, um, the first year, thirteen thousand dollars worth of revenue. Second year came on, we, we cleaned it up, brought in new leadership, grew that side of the business to about 2.8 million. And then in 2021, after COVID um, started to happen and after we really rounded out the current platform you see today, we went from 30 million to 38 million, really fueled by um, Colossus continuing to grow at this accelerated rate. And then we decided to IPO um, in order to give the public if you will, an opportunity to sit in a normal seat that you would actually see a VC firm or a PE firm sit in. And um, now you can see that we have continued to accelerate our growth. And this year, it looks like we're going to be in the 85 to 90 million range based upon forward guidance, um, with a lot of that fueled from the buy side, sell side, complementary business of us sitting on the first dollar in and the last dollar out of the value chain. So the, the model has proven to work over the last four years. And uh, we're continuing to continue that growth into the near future. Absolutely. So what would you say makes direct digital and Colossus and and and, and all your brands, Huddle Mass, what, what would you say makes your tech and your platform unique and different compared to some of your peers out there? Yeah, I would say it's really the uh, two things. It's the operational prowess that we've actually been able to put in place. And I would also say it's the marketplaces that we look to reach. So having a focus in on the small to mid-sized businesses, you have to have an operation that is quick and efficient, that can money on a five dollars $10,000 campaign, just as well as you can make on a million, $2 million campaign. And we have clients that range in those, in those ranges for our buy side of business. On the sell side, um, specifically with the technology, um, Media Math, who is one of the big providers in the industry, they actually rank all 82 SSPs in the marketplace. And we have consistently quarter over quarter been in the top 10 because we have very low IVT because we do a significant amount of an IVT just for the public is um, fraudulent clicks that um, and, and bot clicks that actually are not humans interacting. We actually do a significant amount of filtering on the front end and the back end of our technology to ensure that when the buying community purchase from us, they know what they're purchasing and they get the value that they're expecting to get. It's those practices and processes in the marketplaces that we actually reach that has accelerated our growth. In addition to that, on the sell side business, because we are focused in on the multicultural audiences, which represents about 20% of the total inventory that we have in our, inside of our sell side platform um, in Colossus SSP, it actually has been a, a very attractive um, audience that the buying community is looking to reach. And with 40% of the U.S. population being geared to towards that audience and only two to 5% of all media dollars being targeted to that multicultural audience, we think that there's going to be a lot of headroom for continued growth for the foreseeable future of more and more brands trying to reach those audiences in the future. Why, why, why have those audiences been ignored mostly from the traditional programmatic model? Yeah. yeah, I would say that larger brands um, and Fortune 500 brands have always felt like that they can reach those audiences um, leveraging, I would say, general market advertise, uh, general market publications and general market properties. What they have started to uncover and started to identify when you target those multicultural publishers and those multicultural audiences, reaching them in the authentic spaces where they get specific news, where they get specific um, industry information, where they get specific information specific about either their home or their culture or their audience, um, they're finding that that becomes a much more enriched proposition and more value. And so I think the general market and I think the general broader brands are starting to uncover that there's high value. And one of our clients and partners that we work with is Times of India. So if you wanted to understand 
um, how to get this local scores of a cricket match that actually happened in India. Where are you going to find it on ESPN? It's going to be a little bit more difficult. But if I go to Times of India, I'm going to see that information about my home country. And we're and brands are starting to uncover there's a lot of value there. Absolutely. You know, another question I had for you, you know, you mentioned how you, you a couple of times, how you largely serve the middle market of advertisers. Can you, can you quickly define what that means and what types of brands are we really talking about in this, in this middle market? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. When we talk about the middle market, what we define that is your tier two, tier three media markets. We have salespeople and we have account managers that are actually in Colorado Springs, Nashville, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, Houston, Texas, if you will. And, you know, I would call it flyover country of America, where there's a significant amount of 10, 20, 50 million dollar you know, pest control companies or foundation companies that need digital marketing and have, you know, five, $10 million media media budgets, but who's going to service those dollars and who's going to help them make that transition from traditional media over to digital marketing. And that's the, the hole that we're able to fill. That's the space that we're able to sit in because um, the team that works on that buy side business, they're experts in a broad, broad breadth of industries as well as in understanding the needs of those customers and how those small and mid-sized entrepreneurs, they're not interested in talking about a media mix model, not interested in talking about, oh, well, I had brand reach and awareness. They want ROI. And that's what our team is focused on is performance marketing. Absolutely. Do you also help these companies with creating their media assets as well? Or are you just more like, oh, you have the assets ready to go. Okay. Now we can serve. That's exactly the business that we're in. We try to stay out of the creative space, if you will, and really focus our time, energy, and effort in driving results with um, the outcomes that they're looking for, which is a lot of math, very quantitative view that we take and approach to how we take marketing on that side of the business. Um, but we find that, that that's our sweet spot. When it comes to creative, we have many partners that we work with, and we're absolutely happy to refer them out. But what we like to stay in is the quantitative side of the business and really focus in on how do we drive ROI for every dollar that they spend. Absolutely. No, it's interesting because I think, you know, we we also publish a magazine here. And I remember there were times when we would talk like, oh, we should, you know, thinking about who our audience is like, oh, we should really get some of these high end luxury brands to come in and, you know, be advertisers with us. And it, it it's sometimes difficult even as a publisher and a content creator to be like, all right, we have the audience there that I know this brand probably wants to reach, but how the heck do you get in the door for them to, you know, even evaluate the opportunity? So I can understand where, you know, both on both sides of the coin want to come to a direct to to just at the very least get a get a seat at the table. To interact, exactly. And that's that's really the issue is the seat at the table. Um if you are in these local uh, marketplaces that, you know, I would say are tier two, tier three media markets. Um, it's very difficult to find out who do I go to. So that's part of the name, Direct Digital. You come directly to us and we help you find the resources that you need. And we also have the processes and the technology to help you execute those media plans and those media ideas that you might actually have in order to drive results in ROI. So when we're thinking about growth, how do you Target, how do you figure out that target customer to then tell your sales team, okay, let's go after them so that we can at least give them an idea of the opportunity that they might be missing out on? Yeah, absolutely. What we what we look at is the different industry mixes that we actually are good at working with. Financial services, healthcare, um, CPG, or I would say retail is another one that we're pretty focused in on, um, as well as um, as well as financial services. Those are the, I'm sorry, as well as energy. Those are the five that we're focused in on. And we have a significant amount of experiences with our customer base to work with them. We have the case studies and the expertise. So once we talk to um, different clients and customers on the buy side of our business, um, we're able to understand their pain points, the regulatory issues, the legal issues, and also the tactics that are needed to use and success metrics that are used, needed to use. Because we're managing roughly about 250 to 300 different clients on that side of our business, we have that um, expertise internally to actually have an intelligent conversation and help them digest their business in order to deliver the ROI that they're looking for. For sure. And what's, what would you say is the total addressable market? You know, what, you know, when people are thinking, okay, direct digital holdings, they're starting to capture, they're carving out their niche here. You know, what is that ultimate TAM that, that 
folks should better understand? Yeah, for the total TAM for uh, the digital marketing space or the total advertising space, if you will, is about $250 billion market in the continental U.S. And we're 100 percent focused on U.S. based um, businesses. Um, when you look at the, the segmentation of large brands versus the small to mid sized space, the one that we truly play in, it's about a $57 billion market that is only continuing to grow with a CAGR of roughly 19 percent year over year. So we think that we have a significant amount of tailwinds that are actually entering into this space. And we also see that that growth um, will hopefully continue throughout 2023 and 2024. Very good. And when you're going back real quick to the actual the, the service that you provide and the, tech and the platform itself, the assets that you're delivering, the media assets for the for the middle market advertisers, is it only on desktop or do you also deliver media assets for podcasts? video, you know, all, all native digital stuff? No, no, no. A- absolutely a great question. Um, we work with all types of media types that are in the digital platform. And what I mean by that is your display ads, your audio, like Spotify, we help per- companies to purchase that. Um, we also help them with native advertising and video that you might see on your mobile device. Um, but now the the one that's growing um, and accelerating its specific growth is CTV and OTT, which you probably have heard of, which is streaming. Um, more dollars are moving out of traditional and into streaming platforms, as most people are very familiar with the fact that cord cutting is going on. Well, now, now advertisers are trying to figure out, well, if more and more people are not dis- are not subscribing to cable and they don't watch broadcast, how do I reach how do I reach my end consumer? Well, that's going through CTV and OTT, and that's one of the things that we're experts in. And with the way that our platform is built and the technology that we use and leverage and that we have, uh, we're able to provide um, access to those customers through CTV and OTT so that we can access them through their streaming platforms. Absolutely. So, Mark, you know, you've been a public company now for a little bit. Um, I'm sure you've done, you know, you have an IR firm, you're doing the dog and pony show here and there. You know, what? even after meeting you, taking a look at direct digital, what, what would you say investors still get confused about the company? Maybe we can address some of those frequently asked questions here. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that they there's two things that I think that they get confused of about the company. Um, the fact that we have two sides of our platform, the buy side and the sell side. And the way that I would just simplify it or the way that users can think of it is every time that they access their phone, um, what we do is we help that ad that they might see on USA Today actually appear. And the way it appears is twofold. One, someone had to say they wanted to purchase media through USA Today. But the the second piece of it is that when you see that ad and you and I could be looking at USA Today right now at the exact same time, at the exact same page, and you and I will get two different ads. When you, the reason why you get two different ads is because it looks at the data that you and I use and we have different viewpoints and we're in the different cycle of purchasing products and services always at different times. But what's also going on behind the scenes, which most people don't know, is there's an actual auction that's actually occurring behind the scenes. Our software and our technology actually host and run that auction. And then the highest dollar, the high, whoever's willing to pay the highest dollar amount actually gets access to your eyeballs at that specific time. And we get a percentage of every ad that is actually shown. So every time you look at USA Today and you see an ad on that site, we actually get a percentage of um, that ad that's being displayed. And that's really the the crux of what we do from a business. We just sit on both sides of the transaction. Absolutely. All right. Another question I have for you, you know, look, you know, a few tailwinds, of course, you know, but going into 2023, Let's talk, you know, let's play devil's advocate a little bit, right? You know, I I was recently listening to a podcast that was, you know, with Netflix opening up their ad tier and all these different stream platforms now opening up their ad tier with the idea of potentially going into a recession here in the U.S., you know, potentially less dollars being allocated towards marketing. You know, how how do you think about that potential headwind for the company? And what is, if, if that were to happen, what's some of the strategy you've been thinking about in order to curtail maybe some of that that headwind risk? Yeah, being a, I'm a, you know, of course, I have to say it. Being a publicly traded company, I cannot give four guys. From what you can tell, however, us, right? yes. yeah. Yeah. I, that was on me. I yeah, I said been, that. <laughs> <laughs> My lawyers have trained me well. 
Um, oh, but what I would say is the way that we have structured the business and the way that we look at our business model, um, one of the benefits that we have is that we are focused on that long tail customer. Um, you know, those larger brand, the larger partner, and I wouldn't even say partners, but the larger competitors that we actually um, compete against, a lot of them are focused on the larger brand, the larger brands who I would say are somewhat susceptible to some of those cuts that you're currently are seeing in the marketplace today. With us being focused on the middle market and knowing that there's roughly about 32,000 to 37,000 small to mid-sized business throughout the continental United States that's spending about $57 billion in, in marketing, I think it gives us a ripe opportunity for us to capture more and more market share during this time frame. And that's really the footing that we're planning on um, setting our company up for, for 2023 and 2024, is to use maybe what might be a little bit of an economic downturn to actually go after more business and capture market share in a smart way. We, The way we've structured our business, we believe in smart growth. Um, 25, 30% growth year over year. But we also made a commitment to Wall Street to be a profitable organization. And so we focus in on double digit EBITDA margins so that we can manage those headwinds from an operational perspective in order to ensure that we're able to maintain the growth, but also be conservative in how we actually execute that growth and grab smart market share versus, you know, all the market share that's out there at the cost of profitability. Absolutely. So one more question, just on the devil's advocate side of things, I ask everybody on here, you know, we have already mentioned one, you know, potential headwind and how the company's dealing with that. Are there any other downside risks that you maybe want folks to better understand uh, with regard to direct digital? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's always risk in the marketplace that you're you're looking to manage. I mean, accelerated growth, you're trying to make sure that you grow in a smart way where you don't, um, I'm going to say, break the operations. That's what, you know, I keep my head, you know, that keeps me up at night all the time. Are we doing the right thing for our customers? Are we doing the right thing for our clients? And are we growing in a smart way? That's number one. But there's also, I mean, most of your audience has probably heard the deprecation of the cookie. Um, we do do a lot of work in a, the entire, um, I would say, foundation of the uh, digital marketing space is based on data. Well, when you look at trying to change that data, then you've got to to adjust and adapt to it. And our team and our technology team and our CTO, Anu Palai, um, they're doing an outstanding job to uh, make sure that we have a good plan in place to ensure that if the deprecation of the cookie does occur, that we still have a mechanism and a tool to ensure that we can continue to fuel our growth and actually transact and deliver the ROI that our clients are focused on. So those are pretty much the two um, major, um, you know, issues that we're always staying up and trying to think think about and scenario plan and contingency plan against. And we're hoping that the plans that we put in place will actually help us continue to maintain the growth that we've been able to experience in the past. Very good. All right. Well, you know, from again, from what from what you can tell us, in your opinion, where, where would you like to see the company in three to five years? And what would you say are some of the inflection points that'll get you there? Yeah, no, excellent question. You know, I think I think, you know, we want to continue to see um, our team be able to feel its growth. The inflection points that I think that will help us get there is really uh, bringing on the right talent, bringing on the right expertise and bringing on the right people that can fuel and accelerate that growth. Maintaining the culture that we have been able to establish here with the employee base that we've been able to build and bringing on the level of industry experts is really kind of what we are focused in on through 2023 and 2024. Of course, we want to be, you know, larger than we are. Um, that, I, you know, I'm pretty sure every customer, every uh, company that you've actually had on here says that. Um, but we're looking to do that in a profitable way. And we're also looking to do it in a smart way. So that's really the focus that we have here. And um, we're looking to continue to, to, to continue our current trajectory for the foreseeable future. No, dude, every company comes on here is like, no, we hope to be smaller in three to five years, but, you know, then eventually be way bigger, you know, the, the, yeah. obviously yeah. every single one. Um, so, okay, man, I mean, look, you, you've answered most of my, is there anything I'm missing? I, I feel like you've covered quite a bit here. You know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I mean, is there anything in particular that about the business or trajectory, anything that you want folks to also understand that maybe we didn't cover? Yeah, I mean, the one thing I would I would call out, and um, because we deal with, um, and I'm calling it the long tail, small to mid-sized businesses, and then we also deal 
with your smaller multicultural publishers. The one thing I would call out is, you know, we practice what we preach here. If you look at our board, you look at our leadership team, and if you look at our executive team, it's a majority minority company. Um, if you look at our diversity stats and what I firmly believe, what has been the fuel, uh, what has been able to fuel our growth is really having diverse thoughts, diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences um, on our team, which has been able to accelerate the level of growth that we've been able to experience over the first over the last year. So the one thing I would definitely call out is look at our team, look at that makeup. It is delivered time and time again, and I think it's going to continue to deliver in the future. All right. Well, Mark, uh, my last question for you to close this yeah, out absolutely. here. Yeah, absolutely. Man, you, know, I get, you have another 28 minutes, so uh, <laughs> we are all good. Yeah. You know, listen, you answered, I mean, you know, you answered all all the all the questions and even saw you even had an answer within the question I had. So it, was, it, it works. But, you know, to close this out, you know, like I said, you, you, you've been doing the dog and pony show, you're public company CEO. How's that experience been for you so far? <laughs> Um, I will say it has definitely been a learning experience, um, to say the least. You know, I'm in my, I would say my infancy, if you will, of being a public company CEO. Um, definitely learning um, a lot. Um, but the amount of people I've been able to interact with, the the board of directors that we've been able to assemble, um, it, I, I got to tell you, it's been a great experience. Um, and it's been one that I, I think will, you know, pay off in the long run. Um, the board and the leadership team we've been able to build. I'm learning from every day um, and I'm really excited to get their leadership and their expertise and get their advice and their guidance. So um, it has been a, um, I can't, I can't say I've been working less. I can tell you I'm probably working an extra 15, 20 hours more a week um, from being a private company, if you will. But I would say the learning curve um, has been great, but I've been excited to do it and it's been a great challenge. Welcome to microcap land, man. Uh, yeah. right? it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space, that's for sure. <laughs> space. <laughs> just, I'm being yeah. very political when I say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's, hey, I, this, it's my bread and butter. I love it very much, but it, it, it it's a space. Um, you know what, man? The way that I look at it, um, microcap space is very similar to, you know, the marketplace that we run and looking yeah. at small to mid-sized publishers that we work with. I mean, it's the same. You're looking for those hidden gems that are going to be able to grow and that really deliver value. And so that that to me is exciting, um, you know, to be a part of it. So, yeah, we want to be one of those gems. So that's what that's what I find exciting about it. Very good. All right. Well, Mark, with that, where can our audience go and find more information on Direct Digital Holdings? Yeah, come to our website, directdigitalholdings.com, and um, check out our stock ticker, DRCT. Um, and we'd love to talk to any investor that's out there and I'll provide more information if needed. Very good. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. You too. Absolutely good talking to you, Robert. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.